Hello, Padma. Uh, good to see you again. I'm so glad you can join our Next Wave series. This series has been going on for some time during pandemic time so that we can be able to share the messages and stories of CEOs that we used to do in a big conferences like Samsung CEO Summit, Harman Conference and others, which we can't. So the way we are doing it is really communicating with the leaders through video and trying to get your story reaching out to our crowd. I know you as the uh, chief technologist at Cisco and the one, uh, you know, and then you found the uh, auto startup company Neo with your partner in China, as well as now you found uh, this uh, exciting company Favor. So um, it'll be great if you can share your background with their audience so they can get to know you better. So could you share your journey for us? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with me. As you mentioned, past, uh, I would say, year and a half have been so tough on all of us. And somehow we are figuring out using technology how to stay connected and how to talk to each other and how to continue to build stories and uh, share stories. So, yeah, as you mentioned, my uh, background is all in tech. I've been in the tech industry almost for three decades now. Um, I am an engineer by training. I started my career in the semiconductor industry as a process engineer. And um, I would say the first chapter of my career I spent in the semiconductor industry and uh, became the chief technology officer for, at the time, Motorola Semiconductors, which is now an com uh, independent company called Freescale. That was the first chapter of my career. And then I moved to became the chief technology officer for Motorola, the corporation. And that second chapter was more about mobile. I spent uh, leading all of the engineering teams, building mobile devices, everything from infrastructure to the chipsets that go into mobile devices, all the way to the cell phones. Uh, that was sort of my second chapter. And then I moved to Silicon Valley to become chief technology and strategy officer at Cisco. That was the third chapter in my career uh, where I spent a lot of my time uh, figuring out data center, cloud, um, and leading literally all enterprise focused solutions. And uh, as you mentioned, then I left Cisco to begin my entrepreneurial um, adventures. And I went to a China based startup called NEO at the time to build autonomous electric vehicle. It's now a public company. I left NEO after we took the company public to start my current company called Fable. And we are a consumer. A uh, company focused on uh, helping people improve their mental wellness. So that's sort of been my journey. Currently, I serve on the boards of uh, Microsoft and uh, Spotify. Right, two companies that we never heard of. <laughs> it's great. Actually, you and I have a very similar background in many ways because both of us started in semiconductor industry, which back then Intel and Microsoft, Motorola was one of the leading companies and the Motorola, of course, became part of um, consolidation. Um, and, and of course, the experience you had in mobility, mobile, and then of course, cloud is very relevant to where we live today. And of course, that enabled us to connect and be able to communicate through Zoom. Zoom would not be possible if there wasn't enough advancement in mobility as well as the cloud sharing capability. I want to get your perspective around how your number one, your platform works and what impact it has in terms of our wellness and the way we live. Um, so I'm a big believer in finding simple solutions to very complex problems. And so, so then I started to research what would be a simple solution that we can offer people a, to prioritize their own mental wellness and B, um, you know, adopt a simple thing that could help them. And uh, surprisingly for me, at least maybe not surprising to many people, reading is one of those simple, powerful tools. And there is now a lot of neuroscience that backs up why this is so. Uh, when we read, whether we are reading on a digital platform or an analog 
print book or, or you're reading an ebook or you're listening to an audio book. The format really doesn't matter so much. When we are consuming a story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, our mind allows us to go into a different space and allows us to improve our cognitive abilities, improve our empathy, improve our understanding, because we are relating to the characters in the story, um, you know, what happened to them, you know, even I, you and I are now today talking about my story, your story, how we can share this with everybody who's watching or listening to us, right? And so it's the same exact thing. And I think it is really, that's the motivation behind starting Fable. Um, the product, you know, you asked me, what does the platform have? You know, the, the platform really is aiming to solve the barriers for reading. And if you ask people, why don't you read more? Um, it's interesting, right? All of us want to read more because we reading allows us to sort of like gives us that enjoyment. I've yet to meet a person that says, oh, I wish I read less. <laughs> Everyone says like, oh, I wish I could read more. But you ask them, why don't you? There are three big issues they cite. You know, first problem they cite is like, I don't know what to read. There's so many books out there. I don't know what to read. I look for somebody to give me great recommendations who's an expert on a particular topic, right? And so curation, discovery, and personalization that we take so much for granted with e-commerce, with music, with video, as you mentioned, Netflix does an amazing job suggesting shows we should watch. So does HBO and you know Spotify that, that I'm on the board of does I think an extremely good job of really suggesting songs I should listen to, but there's no really equivalent to that in the reading world. Um, so that's one of the uh, issues we address with our platform is curating great books. Uh, the second issue with reading or barrier to reading is people want it to be much more of a social activity. Um, you know, most people think of reading as a solo activity. I have to sit in a corner and read by myself, but especially young people, they want to be on a social platform, discussing things, sharing their ideas, right? When you read something amazing, immediately you want to tell somebody about that. Um, so the second big pillar to our platform is to build a social platform for reading and readers, like organized groups. Um, they can be private uh, social groups or public social groups, and you join a group and you read with the people that share similar interests as you. Those can be your best friends, or maybe they're not your best friend, but they share the same interests. So that's the second big pillar for Fable. And the third problem with reading is people say, I don't have time, uh, which is which literally means we are not making the time. And what we try to do with Fable is break that up into micro goals for people and help people understand that you don't really need to like sit down and read a 400 page book every day. All you need to do is take 15 minutes out of your schedule and read for 15 minutes every day and you'll finish a book in a month. Um, so I think it's like making these things very much approachable to people and making it a fun, cool platform where people want to be and want to, especially as you mentioned, younger people who are maybe spending a lot of time on social media apps, as I call doom scrolling and you know, dealing with a lot of toxic behavior on social media. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance we go through with that. How do we replace some of that with what I call digital nutrition? So be on a social platform, chat with your friends, but talk about something useful, which will help your mental wellness. So that's what the platform is and, and the reason why I started Fable. Well, your timing is actually pretty good too, given the pandemic and having that started just before that, I would imagine many people get the benefit of connecting, recommending, and being able to share. So uh, it sounds uh, really uh, interesting how you have picked that particular, the, what we call wave of the opportunities. And hopefully that wave is the right wave that you can pit and then ride on it. So tell me about this recommendation engine because I think that is always a tricky part, right? Uh, and and the uh, often that I know that once I write, read some writers in nonfiction or fiction, it, it tends to read similar kind of books. So uh, what is your engine like, and how do you how do you make sure how do you help the, your audience? So rightfully pointed out, 
books are different, right, for recommendation, because it's not that if you like a book by an author, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like every book by that author, you know, you you like it for a particular reason, perhaps. And just because you and I like the same, like a same book, it doesn't mean that we like it for the same reason. Maybe you liked a particular character in the book. That's why you like the book, whereas I like the plot. And that's why I like the book. Um, so why we like a particular book or a story is also important uh, to understand. And so what we do is combine curation with human curation as well as data. So it's not all algorithm driven. We actually go pick a topic that we feel we have a great editorial team. Uh, they look at topics that we feel are important for the society based on whatever we are going through right now, right? Like racial justice, income inequality, uh, social justice, all these topics that are top of mind for a lot of us. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. These are important topics for us as human beings. Uh, we go find topics like that and they can be fun topics too, right? Based on the time of the year, we know summertime people are now getting vaccinated and perhaps will be traveling a little bit and so they'll be looking for books to read while they're on vacation it could be fun topic or it could be a deep dive topic um, like racial justice uh, and it, it's you know it's got a lot of complexity to it so what we do is we choose topics and then we go find experts as we call them taste makers and these tend to be people they maybe they're authors maybe they're business leaders such as yourself or maybe uh, it's somebody who's an athlete you know anyone who's really spent a lot of time I'm passionate about that topic or studying that topic. And we ask them and we call them curators and we go ask our curators to recommend three books that they think are the best books on that topic. And then we choose those books and we go deep in, our team goes deep into those books. We surface insights from that book for people uh, I'm a big believer, we're very different from Amazon in the sense, we don't treat books as, a, as an object, we, we treat as a book, as a vessel that carries a story inside it, and we focus on the story inside it, you know, story is what matters, and, and whether it's an ebook or a print book or an audio book, that's just a vessel that's carrying the story, right, and so if you think of the story as a human experience or something that relates to a human experience, that story itself has a social network of knowledge that surrounds it. Maybe there was a TED talk on that story. Maybe there was an interview the author did in some magazine. Maybe that was made into a Netflix show. Maybe that was a movie. Um, maybe it was made into many movies. So there's all this knowledge that surrounds that story. And how do we actually curate that knowledge as well? Um, so we do both. We not only surface great books, but then we look at the story inside that book and we curate that knowledge around that. Um, and so that you don't, you as a reader don't have to spend all that time. So that's our approach to how we do curation versus just linear recommendations like, hey, you read this book by an author, here's another book by that author, mm -hmm. uh, which is what typically algorithms tend to do. So we combine both technology as well as human curation, which I yep. strongly believe is what's needed when you're looking at something as complicated as a story that was written by somebody right whether it's a non-fiction book or a biography or a fiction that author did a ton of research before they wrote that right and so it's not something that is just skimmable content you do need to invest time in it and so we treat that with a lot of respect so let's talk a little bit about the uh, digital versus analog. You know, people talk a lot about this subject, especially nowadays in, in our, as our life, we're living with the digital tools every day. In fact, I would say I love Zoom, but over Zooming is also probably not that great. Uh, in fact, some of my team members will say we lost our space because Zoom, now there is no physical separation, so you're always on. But same thing even in entertainment, because media is on always from mobile all the way to TV and others, in many ways that um, uh, it may, in, the technology may enhance our living, but maybe also hampering our well-being. So um, I think, you know, I think in your comments regarding what you're trying to do is about getting the balance back and getting the right kind of materials and reading that can help us to go back to the, uh, the kind of enjoyment as well as the well-being that could be enhanced through this experience. Um, 
Do you see this digital media versus analog being in conflict or do you think it's complementary? I definitely see them as complementary. Look, we couldn't have survived last year without technology helping us, right? I think it would have been, think if we didn't have a means to connect with each other on a digital platform like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or what, or WebEx or whichever one, you know, um, you're using, I think it did help us. I'm, you know, obviously I'm a technologist and so are you. I'm a big believer on an aggregate at the macro level, technology has definitely enhanced all our lives. At the same time, there is danger in overusing it and danger in abusing it and using it for the wrong things. And we've seen actually, we saw the implications of that as well, right? Where if technology is not used properly, uh, there's a lot of toxicity that can happen in social media, uh, where if you're not moderated, you're exposed to all of that, and that causes a lot of anxiety and depression and hurts you in, in many ways. Um, it is the right balance. I, I'm a big believer that technology and art have to go hand in hand. And that's what I'm trying to build with Fable, right? You know, there are certain things we consider to be very, very human, like uh, like music, like art, like like writing, like literature, poetry. All these things really allow us to sort of allow us to be empathetic, allow us to understand emotion. And how do we bring that into this hard? world that we think of as technology, which is tends to be much more digital, right? I mean, you're talking about this analog or digital, I think of it as art and technology. Can we bring those two together? Um, you know, the logical side of our brain with the more creative side of the brain. And is there, a, is there an opportunity for us to create new platforms that do that? And that's what Fable is trying to do. I want to talk about corporations. Uh, you are involved with Microsoft, and you know uh, I'm involved with the Cadence and others. So we are both involved in large corporations. What what are some of the things that we can do to improve our well-being of our employees? Yeah, I, great question. And I think if there's one thing that 2020 taught us, uh, taught us as leaders, taught us as uh, human beings, it is that we all need to invest in our own well-being right, mental well-being and physical well-being. And by the way, they go hand in hand. Um, the report after report says that if you're not mentally feeling good and happy, you won't be physically good and happy. So they do need to go hand in hand. I think in the last decade, um, maybe two decades, tech companies have invested a lot in making workplace feel like a fun place. So a lot of people, mental well-being is still, there's a lot of stigma attached with it, right? Like we don't, we don't acknowledge that it's only human to get anxiety and stress. As long as a human being, you're going to have stress and anxiety. It doesn't matter who you are. We're not robots. We have emotions and we feel. And when we have feelings, sometimes we get feelings that causes, um, you know, anxiety. And so that is the first thing we should acknowledge. And we should encourage all of our companies that we participate in, either on boards or we are part of, to make this a priority and invest in their employees' wellness. And, and by the way, sometimes it may need to come uh, top down. You can't just say, okay, here are all the options. You choose which one you want. I think we as leaders have to be engaged as well. And that's my hope is that um, Fable, by the way, is offered to companies as well. I hope employees go tell their companies that we want Fable to be available for us because we want to read together in a team and understand that. And leaders should be part of that group as well because this is one way we connect um, in a very human way with, with our own teams, right? And there are other companies that I think similarly are investing in the wellness space. This definitely should be something companies should be investing in. I don't think it's, I mean, it's actually a business imperative, right? Like I was telling you um, about the World Economic For Forbes, um, World Emin uh, um, Economic Forum article, they cite a $16 trillion productivity loss to companies because of this. And I think there was an article in Forbes recently that talks about employee mental well-being being the top leadership priority in the next decade for up-and-coming leaders. Uh, so these are facts and this is data-driven. It's not even a touchy-feely thing. Um, I think it is something that we need to acknowledge and recognize as a business imperative.
I think often the issue, as you know, in any corporation, they, they, they run through organizations and history and process and structure, but the data is actually what's sometimes missing. So uh, particularly, like you said, the uh, mental or well-being is hard to measure. So yes. being able to deduct that somehow so that you can be able to take those action. Because I know corporations, once they see the data, once they know the uh, uh, causality of it, then they can attack these issues. But sometimes they just don't know. And because also people may not want to share their weakness, their problems with employers. And that is another issue that we're going to deal with. I want to change the subject a little bit to now uh, another experience we had because some of our audience are really interested in this whole idea of autonomous driving, which you've been working on prior to your uh, project today. So could you talk about your concept? I think you talked about Car 3.0 or people talk about Car 3.0. I mean, I have my own interpretation since I've been working with auto industry. I mean, obviously this is an industry been going on for a long time, but I think now we have a lot of technologies that can help, but I want to get your perspective around autonomous or semi-autonomous and uh, where do you see it coming based on your own experience? At a very simple level, my definition of car 3.0 is car 1.0 is mechanical, car 2.0 is mechanical plus electronic, mechatronic, and car 3.0 is much more of a software operating system, you know, how software actually controls a lot of those mechanical systems. And, you know, I think there's many different levels of software. It's not that simple, of course, there's lots of embedded software that controls the mission critical functionality in the car. And there is all the way to sensors and computer vision for automated driving or autonomous driving. So this is, uh, I think, a ripe a platform to innovate and rethink about the car, right? You know, if you were to think of the car more as a heavily compute driven uh, system, how would you architect it? I think that's the challenge in front of a lot of innovators. And uh, it's a very fun thing to think about, right? Like everything from sensors to collecting the data, there's massive amounts of data these sensors would collect. How do you process that? How do you develop algorithms and uh, machine learning techniques to do um, as, you know, for autonomous driving to look at object classification? There's just so many challenges that the industry is working on. And I feel like we're making a lot of progress and, and uh, that's in the software level. And then also the transition from internal combustion to electric vehicle. I think when you move from an IC to an EV, the number of parts and the complexity drops dramatically, which allows us to even a startup, you know, which is now a big company, Neo. When I went there, we were a very tiny startup, uh, become now, you know, a very large automotive company in the world in a matter of three to five years. And, you know, that would have been unheard of before. And Neo was able to do that because we innovated a lot in the electrical vehicle space. So I think both those things coming, right? Like the role the software is going to play and the evolution from internal combustion to electric vehicle, uh, sort of bringing them together is going to completely transform the automotive industry as we knew it. Well, uh, clearly, uh, I think the traditional auto industry is going through huge, huge change. And I think the electrification, uh, automation, the cloud, and the uh, whole, what I call user experience that are driven based on mobility. Uh, so I think these four factors are going to change. And I believe that um, uh, some of the new players might have advantage over traditional players because they don't have to worry about legacy. So uh, as I'm sitting and having discussion with Germany, of course, Germany has the, uh, some of the biggest auto companies that employs more than 10, you know, large number of uh, employment. And with these four major forces, it might have a huge disruption in the industry and something that I think a lot of people should watch very carefully because it does have an impact on players, but also jobs and also supply chain management. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and the new regulations may also come in because of safety standards as the autonomous drive vehicle comes, is it the, um, 
Is it the driver that's responsible for the car? Or is it the car companies are responsible as you take over the, what they call level 3.0 position of the, auto, you know, the autonomous driving? So there are some uncertainty. To me, technology is there and it's going to get better and better because of sensors, because of AI, because of cloud, because of uh, you know, the 5.0. So all this connectivity will improve. And, but the question I don't know is that uh, this whole idea of safety and regulation that have to be in balance and they may take time. I don't know, I'd like to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I think, you know, regulation and technology is an interesting topic, which comes first, right? Uh, in some sense, it's hard for regulation to come before technology because you don't know what you're regulating. Um, so I think it's only natural that technology has to lead the way and we kind of have to apply the technology, see the products, and then think about, okay, what do we need to regulate? At the same time, regulation cannot lag too far behind. And then we get into issues of, okay, now we have safety issues in the case of autonomous driving, like you're saying, who's responsible if should something fail and can we build a fail, fail safe system? I mean, same thing in the data world, right? In the consumer world of who owns the data, you know, that needs to be regulated. We didn't realize all of these implications till we were like so far uh, into it. And so I think it is, it's a tough, uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think the question is which should come first. Uh, the question is when is it the right time for regulation to be applied, right? Like, and so, uh, and how do we make sure people who are responsible for regulation and policy also have a deeper understanding of the technology as technology is getting developed? And it's it's a very complex, uh, I think. Thing to be synchronized on um, because we're all, we're learning as technologies mm. as we are developing we are ourselves learning uh, and then we have we have to take the responsibility to educate the regulators and the regulators have to work in hand hand in hand with the technology practitioners and so um, you know I think we are now recognizing the importance of the role of regulation we still have to figure out the ideal time to bring that and, and allow that partnership to happen. Right. It will be a journey as we all know. But one thing is clear. As we are in the journey, better sensors, more knowledge about, as you described, the objects that are in front of us, being able to keep the lane safe, and being able to center uh, your car that are probably much better than I can drive today. So in many ways, I think technology will improve safety. And at some point, I think we'll know at the right time, we will have a changeover. But to me, autonomous driving car is about the ro robust. And robust has a, um, enough sensors, enough features that can be able to help us drive better. And maybe some point, they can just relax and not worry about it. Yeah, I actually say car 3.0 is a, is a robot. It's a data, it's a data center in its own way, right? Uh, and it's, it's a computer. And so it's sort of like a very different way we have to think about cars of the future. I want to talk about one other subject, which is a uh, gender gap in tech. Uh, we, we often don't think much about it because we do, and I believe tech has been very marriage driven but you've been in a, a female leadership and you have seen in a large corporations uh, as a board member as well as operating members. W what do you see today and where do you think we are and where do you think we need to go? We still have a long way to go, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I think we're making progress, but very, very incremental progress versus like big leap prog progress in, in uh, the whole industry, but specifically the tech industry being much more inclusive, right? And I think we have to, I feel personally, we have to move beyond talking about inclusion and diversity and start talking about belonging. Um, because, you know, it's easy, while it's important to focus on numbers and we say, yeah, we should recruit more women, we should recruit more minorities into the tech industry. What is even more important is once we've recruited them, making them feel like they belong there and they have a voice there and they can be successful there. If we don't do that, it's a leaky pipe. You know, we hire people, we lose people. And this always happens in the tech industry. So I have now started to encourage all the leaders in, in 
tech industry to really thinking about how do you change your culture where everyone feels like they can belong. It can't be one stereotype image of here's a here's an image of what you need to be to be successful. Um, and so that means allowing people to be authentic, rewarding them for their performance, giving them a voice, giving them a seat at the table, having more board members that are different, um, that bring different perspectives and that are diverse all the way through the leadership. Uh, that's super, super important. And unfortunately, tech companies have not made as much progress as I wish they had made. Yeah, I know uh, at the boardrooms, we all now ask questions about how many management positions not just how many percentage of female, but actually at the right position, because I think leadership uh, matters. And when there's the right leadership, then I think it, it encourages more people to be uh, in the same seat. And I think the belonging is a very good way to capture the essence of the issues that we have to work on. So that's great. Now, last question for you. You've been uh, a leader in a large multinational corporations but also you've been now CEO of startup companies. So you really have this dynamic range. Actually, a lot like me, right? I've done the similar large company and startups. So all of us, some of us, not all of us, has done this. What are some of the things that you want to share for those people that want to leave big corporations and want to do their own things? And I, as you know, when you do that, it's not that easy. Actually, it's very, very difficult, I found. When I left Intel, doing my startup job, I realized that my batch is gone. I'm just like, just like anybody else, and you have to earn that spot. But I think I'm just curious your perspective on what advice you have for those entrepreneur wannabe managers in you know, big corporations. Yeah, it's a great question. I always get asked what's harder. Um, and I think, I think they're different. Uh, definitely doing a startup is a lot harder. I think it's a lot harder. I think when you're in a big corporation, you have stability. You have the brand of the company attached to you and your role, right? And so that, that's, that's a lot. People shouldn't underestimate how much a big being part of a big brand uh, opens doors for you. Um, you know, you have a lot of support. There are a lot of people helping you to do your job. You have resources, uh, you have global scale. All these things are what you get when you're part of a big corporation. Um, and in return, it is very demanding. You know, jobs inside big companies are super demanding on your time. In a startup, you have to have a lot of resilience, right? It's like up and down every single day. One day you're happy, next day you're sad. And, and there's no support. You're on your own. You have your vision. Uh, you have to convince people to leave big companies to come work for you. I recruited 25 people during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I built my current company all basically haven't, we haven't met each other. We've all been remote. We've only met each other digitally. Um, you know, so it's a lot of personal energy you have to put into your job and it is you and you alone, you know, I think it is rewarding in that way. When you get success, you look and say, wow, we did this, you know, it's a small team and we all did this, um, you know, whereas, uh, and that's rewarding, but at the same time, it's a, it's a lot. I think what matters, what is similar, I think, between a big company and a, a small company, at least my view, the team matters a lot. Recruiting great team is the biggest thing in a startup because you can only have like 15 or 20 people in the first year. That's a lot for a startup. And so those people matter and you have to really, really be careful who you hire. And the culture is super important. Um, you know, some of these things apply to a big company as well. And so what I've learned in my big company that I'm bringing to you my startup are things like how do you scale? How do you make sure as you're building things, you're iterating fast? Um, you know, how do you make sure you're hiring the best talent? How do you create a system where everybody can feel that they can contribute? The importance of the culture. Some of these things I learned well with my experience in a bigger company that I'm bringing to my startup. Uh, but yeah, definitely doing a startup is not easy and it's a lot of hard work and you have to have a lot of passion in the vision um, because that's solely what drives it in the early stages for sure. Resilience is, is actually the good, good summary of that. You just have to uh, adapt and uh, it's not easy to adapt when you used to have a big support system. 
So that dynamic range is what I found to be extremely important to deal with a, um, uh, being able to change from large to small. And then, of course, whatever you do, you're building your own brand now. And you and your company are so integrated, integrated whereas in a large company like Cisco Intel, you know, we are beneficiary of the brand that was built by founders. So that's probably one of the big changes that I remember from my own journey. But I, will, I think I just enjoyed both sides. One, I learned a lot. The other one, you practice a lot. Yeah, no, I love both too. They're very different and they demand very, very different levels of, I would say, EQ and IQ. Um, yeah, I love being very scrappy now. We just hustle every day. We just sort of like working on new features, getting the new features out, which is super fun, exciting. You can move so fast in a startup. But I love the scale at Cisco. I loved having a big team and like motivating 26,000 people to see your vision, talking to all our customers. That was exciting as well. So both are great. I think it just depends on the stage of your career, your life, what you, what are you itching to do and, and you, what are you drawn to do? I'm a big believer, by the way, that we always have to choose the work we love because if we love what we do, then we, the amount of time you spend on that doesn't feel like a chore and doesn't feel strain. You know, it becomes fun. Because um, we are, you work hard, it doesn't matter whether you're in a big company or a small company. Great. Really appreciate your time. And I think it's a great uh, sharing your story and your journey, which is a very big dynamic range. And a lot of our, uh, our audience, I'm sure they're thinking about different career, different issues. Uh, we're inspired by some of the uh, uh, messages you've given today and really appreciate your time joining the Next Wave speaker series. Thank you so much and hope to see you and everyone else on Fable. Great.